It'd be a lot cooler if you did. <laughs> Okay, so here I'm going to do my best Matthew McConaughey impression. Okay, you ready? All right, all right, all right. meets film. I am your host, Dr. Alex Swan, and in this episode, we are going to go back to high school. We're going to be talking Dazed and Confused. Dazed and Confused, 1993 cult classic, I would call it. I think that's what I want to, I think that's the grouping that it works in. A lot of great early career actors in this movie, lot of interesting conversations about life and high school and living and norms and all it there is so much in this movie and it really is only about an hour and 40 minutes it's got a lot of stuff crammed into it now the movie was directed and written by Richard Linklater who has done some phenomenal work after this movie. You know, he's done stuff like Boyhood. He's done a lot of other really interesting movies. But I think I think a lot of audiences, and I call this a cult classic, a lot of audiences just come back to Richard Linklater's just kind of snapshot of what happens uh, on the last day of school for high school students in the 1970s. The movie came out, you know, almost 20 years after the setting of the movie, and it's quite a timeless classic, to be honest. So there's not a lot that has changed, maybe a little bit now as we are uh, moving toward a life post-pandemic, post-COVID-19 pandemic. Maybe some things have changed, but really there's not a lot. And and so some of the themes that we're going to talk about today tend to be timeless. So some stars, like I said, a lot of interesting faces and career launching or career beginnings for some of these actors. So breakout role, I, I, and not even a main character, but breakout role for Matthew McConaughey, and the birth of a catchphrase, uh, the all right, all right, all right, that's what he does as his character Wooderson. We'll definitely talk about him a little bit later. But uh, Jason London plays the main character of Randall and uh, Randall Floyd. And so his nickname is Pink because Pink Floyd was a big band at the time. So, of course, of course. And we've got uh, Rory Cochran plays a uh, stoner named Ron Slater. Joey Lorton Adams, who is a feature in many of the uh, View Askew universe. Uh, so she was one of the she was the lead in uh, in Chasing Amy. Mila Jovovich has a lot of on-screen time, but not a lot of talking in this movie, which I thought was interesting. Adam Goldberg, definitely going to talk about his character in Mike Newhouse because, boy, oh boy, his his uh, character is hilarious. Uh, Anthony Rapp uh, is in this movie as well. And I really thought he was going to uh, end up uh, gay in the story when I first saw it, knowing that Anthony Rapp was is gay and uh, th- you know had his big role in Rent and all of that stuff. So I thought he was going to uh, come out uh, in this movie when I first saw it in, I don't know, the early 2000s or something like that. I did not see this in the 90s, of course. Uh, but 
the funny thing about his character is not so much, you know, his sexuality, but um, his name is Anthony and his character's name is Tony in the movie. So it's like not a very big stretch to be like, hey, Tony, and, and him look at you. <laughs> a Cole Hauser it has a role in this and he's the one I always get confused with um, a few other actors, but he's the one who's got the really deep uh, dimple in his chin. And then, of course, my favorite early role in this movie is and has to be Ben Affleck as O'Banion, one of the football jocks. Oh, my God. Such an interesting role that he had in this 1993. Of course, not his first acting role. He was acting as a as a child in commercials and stuff. But this was like one of his bigger speaking roles. Not a main character in the movie by any stretch of the imagination, but has some of the best scenes related to the hazing that we'll talk about in this in uh, in this conversation in in this movie. So there's so many faces that we see later. You know. Kudos to Richard Linklater for finding these, finding these amazing faces, finding these amazing voices, and putting it to small town America. Now, one of the major criticisms is this is a very white movie. This is a very white movie. There is a black character in it. There's a black student in it. But honestly, this is middle America uh, white. And we're not going to really touch on it, so I wanted to make sure that I, I, I put that out there uh, so everyone recognizes that this is not necessarily the only indication or only experience of, of high school in the 1970s. So this movie just squeaked by as being a commercial success did not do great in the early 90s um essentially made maybe about a million dollars over its budget so again not really a commercial success but definitely a philosophical psychological uh cinematic and artistic success and i think that shouldn't go without saying i think we do necessarily need to say that and so without further ado like i like to say let us jump into a discussion of dazed and confused my guest host today is dr chris miller chris is a professor uh, at the university of alaska fairbanks in the psychology department Chris graduated with a PhD in social psychology from the University of Minnesota and is still very fond of the North Star State. Who wouldn't be? His research has focused on how people try to manage their self-esteem, which is really great for the movie that we're talking about today, including the potential threats or benefits to it that come from our social connections or group memberships. Chris, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here. I'm really happy to have you on because not only does your research align with uh, Days and Confused, so we have uh, a great uh, field expert on the show, but you also like referencing, as we briefly discussed before uh, talking, before recording today, uh, that you do reference film in your teaching. So I wanted to broadly ask, as I do all of my guests, your broad thoughts on films and their place in psychology and their place in teaching psychology. I think of film and the arts are a great thing to incorporate into any, any kind of person-centered science. Because, yeah. you know, psychology is a relatively young science. Yeah. Uh, but thinking about ourselves and other people is as old as the human species and probably older. Yeah. So, you know, so much of psychology is innate to human nature and, and as, as the arts are as well. Mm-hmm. So, you know, you can't be a good writer without knowing how to come up with believable, believable characters You can't be a good actor without understanding how to communicate your emotions and motivations. Mm -hmm. You can't be a good director without understanding how all those pieces fit together and those cinematic choices are affecting your audience. So, you know, to me, that's all psychology, too. 
Yeah. So good artists usually have a good intuitive sense of psychology. I think that's a a, a great way of phrasing it. And I'm going to file that away for my eventual uh, write up of of my activities on this show mm -hmm. and my activities uh, just about film pedagogy in general. Those are that's it's a great way to put it, because I think specifically to your point about directors, because that really piqued my that, that that really piqued my interest there, as you said that. Uh, Richard Linklater, who is the uh, the director of Days and Confused, I think understands that really well, considering this movie and, and its timeless quality, as I mentioned at the top of the show, but also a movie that came out more recently, like Boyhood, where he's literally following a boy, a single person for this person's actual development, mm -hmm. which I think is one thing. Truly amazing as far as filmmaking goes, because nobody's ever done anything that ambitious. Uh, but it also shows a, a, a an appreciation of what changes in a person's life as they get older. So I think you make a really good point, not just from the actor's perspective, not just from the writer's perspective, but from the director, the the person who's putting this vision all together. I think that's wonderful. I, I, I was just going to say just going to say that. Uh, I feel it's like so much of, of Richard Linklater's work, if you just describe it briefly, like it doesn't sound like that should work. Is his first two movies, this one included, are basically just kind of somewhat aimless movies following following around young people doing young people's stuff and yeah. having very normal, naturalistic conversations. There's really not any drama or any stakes, mm. but it you know, it, it works somehow, you know? And I, I, I can't explain that how it does, but I, I love these movies. Yeah, and 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 honestly, I think that piece of filmmaking is often disregarded because of the lack of plot, the lack of stakes. Why should we care about these characters? All that kind of stuff. But really, what he's doing is he's just mirroring us, in and especially in this movie, mirroring different levels of high school, and we can probably see uh, some of all, all of ourselves maybe mm. not everybody who watches this movie because they did mention how white it was but can see us in some of these characters and even some of the older characters in the movie so the adults you you know if you watch it later you can be like oh yeah i get i get why uh you know the, the mom pulls the gun on obanion because she, she doesn't want her uh, son to be hazed. You know, like that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So y you make a great point that they're aimless, but they do reflect uh, us in, in a, like I said, I'm, I'm probably going to reference timeless kind of way, but a lot in this episode. But I mean, it's it's there. Yes, yeah, certainly, certainly now being on the other side of dealing with young, young adults, <laughs> uh, yeah. so, so some of these things don't land the same way as they did when I was first watching this movie when I, when I was a young adult. So that's true. But, I'm sure they could uh, find how their their high school experience these days have have changed. But also as things change, they also stay the same. So, mm -hmm. you know, that's that's. That's going to be there. I see that. So now that we've discussed uh, film in general, let's pivot to, even though we kind of have been already, uh, <laughs> your choice here more specifically on Days and Confused. So I reached out to uh, or you reached out to me because I put a call out and uh, you responded to that call. And I asked you what kind of, what movies would fit your your world, your expertise. And you you centered uh, you, you gave me a couple of options, but I saw Days of Confused and I was like, oh, my God. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So what uh, what led you to that as one of the choices and also referencing it in your um, your teaching? Well, first of all, I just love this movie. So anytime <laughs> I can work my own uh, preferences and interests in the class, I usually will. Absolutely. Right. But also, you know, uh, when I took my first psychology class or so social psychology class, uh, I should say, uh, I remember thinking, wow, here's a class that really helps me understand how people behave in the real world. Mm hmm. 
right? Social psychology actually has its roots in uh, sociology as much as psychology. Mm -hmm. And some of the methods, particularly in the early days, kind of reflect that. So more field research, naturalistic observation, or even participant observation. Uh, in fact, uh, one, of my one of my favorite social psychology studies was when a couple of social psychologists joined a doomsday cult. Mm -hmm. I so do. that they yeah, could be there great. and observe how the cult members responded to the experience of their quite loony prediction failing to come true. Right. You know, it's that sort of kind of on the ground, uh, almost Indiana Jones ish, you know, type of social psychology. I, I really find really fascinating. So, mm -hmm. you know, uh, we don't do as much of that anymore in the field. <laughs> uh, I would say, unfortunately, uh, the ethics boards say and that's probably for the best. <laughs> yeah, I would say so. You know, but, you know, glorified people watching to me is, is a part of social psychology. And this, you know, this movie is great because it pretty much just is people watching. You know, there's, mm -hmm. there's not a lot of drama or high stakes conflicts. There's no big, oh, who am I going to take to the prom mm -hmm. or, you know, I have to kiss that one girl before I graduate because that's the plot of the movie or whatever. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just teens hanging out, trying to party and do team things. Yeah. Uh, the, the conversations feel very natural. Their behavior, you know, seems pretty, seems really natural. And, you know, as a professional people watcher, I just enjoyed this movie so much and, you know, always catch, you know, spot little things in it that you know, I'm like, oh, that reminds me of this thing that I teach sometimes. Or that, you know, that behavior there, I, I think they're doing this other thing that, you know, I've I've studied or seen before. So, right, right. And and it makes a lot of sense that we when we when we watch this movie, when people watch this movie, however old they are, or whenever they see it, you know, 93 or now that. Again, it just it it seems like we could know these people. Mm -hmm. And and as you said, the plot, if you know, if there is kind of one, it's like very loosely defined as uh, it's the last day of school. And we essentially follow a, a a set of groups and a set of characters from the beginning of the day to the following morning. And that's mm -hmm. it. It's a it's a like a 24 hour experience and that's it. Mm -hmm. And and a lot of stuff happens in this 24 hours. We go from group to group, little vignettes to little vignettes here and there. We we consider a few of these people to be main characters uh just by virtue of their speaking roles and and how people communicate with them. Mm -hmm. But it it's honestly like we're just following a bunch of people that we've known for a long time. And I think that's a great, uh, it, 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 like I said a, a little bit ago, it is not necessarily the norm of filmmaking. It's not trying to tell a story with a beginning, middle, rising action to mm -hmm. conflict, to resolution, end kind of three-act play structure. It's just watching people, as you said. Right. It, it's, it's kind of just life almost, you know, it, mm -hmm. it seems very believable, you know, it, it, it's kind of funny. I've actually watched some of the uh, deleted scenes and whatnot, like on some of the I, I think I actually have like the Criterion Collection edition of this movie, which has a bunch oh, nice. of extra features. And it's so funny seeing those deleted scenes like, wow, like this feels really awkward, you know, because it's so like stilted and naturalistic. But somehow yeah. in the film, like they, they they've got it down. It all it all works out. But w when you see the scenes that weren't put in, and you're like, oh wow, that's not good. I can <laughs> see why that's not in there. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, I think again, good filmmaking eye there from Linklater, who was like, no, this isn't going to work. Mm -hmm. It's not needed. Yeah, because I don't have a fully flesh out story. Mm -hmm. And they just seem a little wooden in here in this in this little bit that we did. So I yeah, get to cut that yeah. out, and which is great. And apparently there, there were actually some like uh, changes made on the fly because apparently uh, I was just uh, 
reading some gossip from the making of the movie or something, like a couple of the actors like really hated each other. So early in the movie, <laughs> they, 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 they had a number of scenes together, but they kind of like rewrote like on the, the final scene. You know, I believe I believe the final scene uh, on the football field, uh, the Matthew McConaughey character, uh, Wooderson, was not supposed to be there. You know, someone oh. else was supposed to be there, but you know that actor and the actor who played Pink had gotten into a fist fight on set one day, and like, okay, oh, let's wow. just keep these two apart and swap in a different, different, you know, different guy. <laughs> and of course, Matthew McConaughey at the time, relatively unknown, mm-hmm. and uh, he, you know, he was he he was probably a lot like Wooderson. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, probably a good choice. I wonder if it was Ben Affleck. Oh man! Uh, no, I say I believe it was the actor who played uh, Pitford, the uh, the mm, okay. stoner slash part time drug dealer. Gotcha, gotcha. Who, who apparently also like his girlfriend was played by the sixteen year old of uh, Mila Jovovich yeah. in the film, who yeah. barely has any lines. Yeah, exactly. I it's it's so weird because you're like, wait, that's. Lilu. <laughs> yeah. Only two years later. It's wild. Yeah, I know. And apparently, apparently like mid shooting, the two of them eloped and like to Las Vegas and got married, even though she was like 16 years old. Wow. Okay. There, there's like a, a lot of like really honest, like teenage shenanigans going on in yeah. the filming of this teenage shenanigan movie. Well, you know, you got to find the right people, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> believable. Yeah. Okay, all you freshman f***s, listen up! It's your lucky day. Usually you'd be spending your freshman summer getting your asses busted and running for your worthless little lives. But this year, because we feel so sorry for you, we're gonna take it easy on you and save us all a lot of time. So if you meet here, right here, after school today, you only get one lick from each of us. But you run like cowards. Well... It's open season all summer long, boys. Oh, yeah, Mitch Kramer? Mitchie, 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 Mitchie. <laughs> We're looking for you, pal. Your ass will be perfect for the day is over. Have a nice afternoon. <laughs> you better get out of town. Go spend the summer with your grandparents or something. Hey, man. You are going to show up to our game tonight, aren't you? Yeah, I'm pitching. I kind of have to. How should we inscribe your tombstone? <laughs> How about Ben Over? <laughs> yeah, right, pissant. Why aren't they after anybody else? <laughs> they are, man. Believe me. I know. Man. So let's jump into some of the site concepts of the, of this movie and and how it works so well in uh, a. A, uh, a film that can be used to address some of these things in a in a direct artistic kind of way. And I think the the thing to start with in in our discussion here is the broad groups and social identities that essentially are quintessentially high school. Mm-hmm. So, uh, Chris, if you could do the us, uh, uh, me and the listeners, and and describe what a clique is. Mm-hmm. Uh, a clique is a term that is primarily applied to kind of adolescents or teens, although you know uh, that there's not necessarily a limitation on them. But a clique is really just a group of people who have similar interests, and uh, you know. Are, are are connected primarily through their interests mm-hmm. and uh but you know they also have uh, shared uh relationships as well okay and what are the clicks that we see in the the movie i think there are like i don't know maybe about five or so clicks that we see in the movie mm-hmm. uh I'd say pro- probably the two most prominent cliques are kind of the the uh, the jocks, the uh, football players specifically, mm-hmm. and of course the kind of more uh, drugs and rock and roll crowd, of of which the the somewhat main character Pink is kind of floating between both of these here. So he, sure, 
he kind of has a foot in both camps. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And then uh and then there are a couple of other smaller clicks I would I would mm-hmm. have, I would say, yeah, right? Yeah. The, 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 there's an of uh, there's another little click of uh I, I don't quite want to call them nerds, but you know, they clearly are the somewhat more intellectual members of the yeah. uh, of the group here that they, they are not uh not necessarily into partying or sports. Mm-hmm. And uh that you know, that's uh Tony and Cynthia and uh Mike. Right. You know, yeah. who we see. And then and then, you know, the, the, there's some other characters who I wouldn't necessarily say they're different cliques, you know, but there are kind of a group of a, a number of freshman characters. So most of the mm-hmm. movies are following in the character are uh, seniors, you know, uh, having right. just having having uh, just finished their junior year. It's the last day of school of their junior year. They now kind of appoint themselves seniors and all the rights and responsibilities that go with that. Yeah. Such as tormenting the new freshmen, so the you know a, a, a number of kind of basically middle school m- middle school characters who mm-hmm. uh, we also kind of follow in the movie as well, which is interesting. I, just a little sidebar because it, this is set in the 1970s, mm-hmm. um, and from my understanding, and and this might be I I don't know where you went to high school, um, but I went to high school in California, and it wasn't that long before i i went to high school that um ninth grade which is classically referred to as as the freshman grade Mm -hmm. was actually still a part of junior high and junior high was seventh eighth and ninth was Mm -hmm. that your uh experience going to school or were you later like me where ninth grade was now part of high school uh Ninth grade was part of high school for me, but okay. I feel like it, it happened a recent change. Like I was aware of the alternative, right? Yeah, um, and 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 certainly uh, from my parents' perspective, uh, they they had the the three and three, which for the nineteen seventies makes a lot of sense because that's when my mom was in high school, mm-hmm. um, and so I'm, I'm <laughs> they were referring to it as junior high, but it sounds like they were maybe going from eighth to ninth grade, but still in the same building. I, I don't know. It doesn't make any sense. That's it's neither here nor there. <laughs> but they are referred to as freshmen. So mm-hmm. think of who that who that refers to in your own mind, listener. Uh they're younger students. That's that's yes, all we'll say. Absolutely. And they are uh they're gonna learn a learn a lot on this last day of uh school, surprisingly. Or, or at least some of them will. Yeah, right. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> and then we have a group of uh, juniors matriculating into seniors, uh, mm-hmm. uh, women who participate in what, what I wanted to talk about next, which was the ritualistic nature of joining a group. Mm-hmm. And that is referred to as hazing. I'll tell you what, just for being such brave little kids, I'm only going to give each of you five licks. Okay? <laughs> All right, grab a pole then, kid. Let's get going. I don't think so, creep. Mom? Carl, get in the house. Get in the house! Oh. And you, get the hell off my property. Oh, well, I'm sorry, ma'am. I was just uh, escorting your fine young son home from school. There's, There are some ruffians about, and I... Oh, and uh, Mitch, Carl. We'll be seeing each other again. Excuse me. Thank you. (laughs) All right, you little freshman bitches. All right. That was pathetic. Let's try it again. That means get up, you lazy little bitches. Get up. And see, what's fascinating is the way not only the school, but the entire community seems to be supporting this, you know, or at least turn their heads. I mean, they apparently have permission to use the parking lot. Right. No parents seem to mind. You know, they're selling concessions, you know. I mean, <laughs> I know. So what are some of the hazing activities that we see in the movie? 
Yeah, it, uh, in the movie, there's kind of a, uh, kind of a gender split in how they are hazed. So uh, freshman uh, boys are hunted down by the uh, seniors who have wooden paddles, and they are paddling. Frightening. Uh, it doesn't seem there's any official rules how it goes, but th- th- there are a, a lot of various customs. Apparently, all summer long, in, I guess until the first day of school, uh, freshmen are considered a fair game. Yeah. Although uh, apparently there's kind of some uh, some traditions to like, well, you know, uh, if a kid's been paddled a couple times one night, you can give him a break for a few days. Or maybe, you know, once you've paddled one kid once, that's probably enough. You don't need to <laughs> keep returning to that well. I, I'm I'm laughing because it, it is it is laughable that a, a town like this would keep this tradition alive. But, you know, it, it's a fictional town, so I, it is what it is. Uh, what mm-hmm. do the women, what do the girls and women do? Uh, the girls uh, are just like taken to the high school parking lot where they are uh, in, forced to engage in embarrassing acts. And, you know, they are paraded around, food is thrown on them, and they are forced to kind of humiliate themselves in front of other seniors. It, it's... Uh, not as painful, but probably more embarrassing, uh, their actions. Although in the movie, it's, it's, it's almost presented as if part- participating in the female hazing is kind of a privilege mm-hmm. because the, the actual scene where we see that happening, some girls are kind of being taken away to do that. Mm-hmm. And one girl who we end up kind of following, uh, she named her. Her name is Sabrina. Mm-hmm. She's at first not included with the girls who are going off to be hazed. And right. one of the seniors kind of makes a spot decision to include her. Yeah. And that is – so, again, there, there kind of seems to be a little bit of, like, the, the in and the out crowd to that there, you know? Right. Uh, perhaps more akin to how uh, fraternities and sororities do it there. It's like you, you have to, right. you know, be invited to be a part of this, and then, yes, we will haze you. Right. Yeah, right. Whereas, whereas and, as, as for the freshmen, the freshman boys, if you're a freshman, you kind of have a mark on you and they can come after you. So it's there's not necessarily the same quite same sense of uh, prestige or invitation to taking part in that ceremony, if, if you want to call it that. And I feel there's a little sexism involved, too, uh, or uh, different gender gendering for the two kinds of hazing right so the the male hazing is physical and Mm -hmm. and you got to show that you are a man and that you can take these beatings and then for the women uh again 1970s you know can you uh be domestic can you please a man i mean there's this one humiliating scene where um sabrina is is uh, put in front of another uh, one of the senior now that they're seniors and Mm -hmm. um, is in a position on her knees and essentially to the point of providing oral sex. Right. It's just obviously prevented there. Everyone's fully Mm -hmm. clothed and all of that. But the positioning is obviously suggestive. Yeah. They're putting this. uh suggestive positions they're you know ask suggestive and you know offensive questions just again right. really the, the point there is humiliation which again yeah uh, kind of does track you know with the long kind of identified differences in kind of aggression between men and women you know mm-hmm. male aggression is primarily physical uh women's aggression is primarily kind of social so gossiping right. shaming shunning you know, those types of kind of things that that uh, threats to one's uh, kind of social reputation or social standing are more common in uh, in female forms of aggression. So, yeah. And you bring up a good point um, it, with respect to that. So what is uh, the talking about the hazing experience, how we can as viewers on the outside watching this, there are a couple of characters who also play that role for us and um really summing up the rituals of the town and how all of this is passed from generation to generation uh you 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 you, uh 
he put some clips in here, and I'll, I'll go ahead and play those. Uh, but Clint and Tony, who are, or uh, sorry, Mike and Tony, who are um, the the nerds, as you say, quote unquote, yes. are offering their commentary. Yeah, I love that that little conversation of uh, Tony and Mike because. To me, they are the social psychologists of the movie, right? They they are right. the kind, kind kind of the people watchers, you know. Yeah, uh, I'm not exactly clear if they are themselves seniors or or if, if they are a year younger. You know, oh, okay. uh, yeah, that's the, unclear. Yeah, uh, they do have some interactions with Pink, who is a senior. Mm-hmm. Uh, but you know, either way, you know, if, if, even if they were seniors, they don't seem like the type to. to to participate in these uh, rituals again, the the football players, uh, the football click or the jock click seems to be very active in the uh, hazing with the paddles. Yeah. Uh, in the background, you see other characters doing it as well, so it's probably beyond the athletic click. But you know, the uh, our our budding social psychologists there of uh, Tony and Mike are you know not doing that, but the other kind of kind of think, wow, it's like. This just goes on, and whole town's okay with it. Apparently, you know, mm-hmm. no one's parents are calling the police. Presumably, Mm-mm. you know, uh, Mitch's mom, of course, uh, has her own Texas size solution. But <laughs> <laughs> I love it, and you you almost get the best reaction from Ben Affleck's O'Banion. It's just like, oh no, I'm 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 you know when the guns pointed at him, it's like, oh no, we're just we're just friends. We're buddies. We're hanging out. And then she goes inside and uh uh Mitch and uh you know Mike Kramer stick their heads out and he's like, I'm I saw that I'm coming for you boys. <laughs> Still probably an earshot of Mitch's mother. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And then, you know, his mom has to understand the, uh, the ritual, but like, not on my front step. You're not <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. You can do this somewhere else, but if yeah. it's on my property, not yeah. much. And, um, the, uh, the mom at the end, I believe is, yeah. Or Carl's mom pulls the gun on O'Banion and uh, she's like, I don't want this on my porch at all. Mm-hmm. But, you know, you can do this elsewhere uh, around town. It's totally fine. But then I like Mitch's mom at the end. Mitch uh, being the kind of main character of the up and coming freshman. freshman who's been awake all night mm-hmm. and maybe had a possibly, little bit of alcohol. Yeah, possibly drunk. Possibly drunk. Right. Exactly. <laughs> uh, had illegally purchased alcohol at some other point in the uh, the night mm. uh and you know his mother's like you know you were out all night are you drunk and then she's like <laughs> i'll let this slide once more and i thought it was really interesting because this movie's set in 1976 and there's a lot of literature out there for uh, Generation X, which comes right in before millennials. And so this 1976 period for these these kids. And I thought it was so funny that um, I was like, no wonder Gen Xers think that they're forgotten because their parents let them do whatever. <laughs> I thought that was I thought that was really funny. Yeah, yeah, certainly the uh, the uh, the era of uh, helicopter parenting had not yet uh, right. taken place in 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 this uh, at, the, at the timeline of this film. So right. So I thought I thought that was very interesting as far as the hazing rituals in the town. Mm-hmm. And then there was one there was one particular kind of activity that they did and i didn't actually pick up on this but i thought it was great so uh chris do you want to explain the bowling ball and how you would use that in social psych yes the bowling ball scene so yeah shotgun uh woods i'm here man you come along Uh, yeah why not you boys have fun, now. Listen, I'm gonna give you shotgun, but I want you to know it's because only because I'm going inside. But keep that in mind. Right? 
Hey man, whose bowling ball is this? It's yours, man. Later. Hey, hey man, what's happening? Play a little foosball? Yeah. Alright. <clears throat> bowling ball. Yeah. Throw the bowling ball. Yeah. Think I should? Yeah. Do it. Do it. Do it. Do it. Come on, you're playing with the big boys now, Do man. Do it. Do it. Throw it. If I get Susie Pussy special, throw it! Throw it! Heave it! <laughs> that bowling ball sent him up to that damn windshield. <laughs> yeah. Oh, <laughs> you're nuts, nice, Junior. You're nuts. Nice. <laughs> hey, man. We're out of here. We gotta make a grab and go stop. I don't have any money. Who's got money? Uh, I get my money. Where's your money? Nah, it doesn't matter. Okay, pull and heading out that way. On, on one level, uh, you might look at that scene and say, oh, you know, you know, here's a great example of kind of peer pressure and conformity going on. So I uh, got uh, three seniors in a car and that one freshman, Mitch, who in the movie, uh, in a way, almost portraying the positive side of hazing. You know, mm-hmm. he uh, he got paddled pretty bad that day, mm-hmm. but uh, Pink kind of takes a. Uh, takes uh, uh, an, an interest in him and kind of says, hey, you know, I'll, I'll give you a ride home. And then, yeah. you know, hey, I can come back and pick you out and uh, you can come out and party with us. You know, so he's kind of be, you know, being invited into the group here. Right. So, you know, he gets a chance to hang out with his seniors and party with them. You know, you know, gets to uh, go into the pool hall where the seniors and older kids hang out and drink beer and yeah and uh uh f- at f- at the scene of the bowling ball there he's in the car riding around with mm-hmm. you know a couple of uh seniors and you know he's obviously the only freshman there right so uh the seniors are smoking a joint and mm-hmm. uh have, have already been drinking all night here so they are uh well uh into trouble well cooked. And, uh, uh, decide to 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 uh, to uh, to uh, 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 start up a game, which it appears they've done before here, where they uh, lean out the car windows, grab trash cans, then speed up and throw the trash cans at mailboxes and try to break them down. So some good old fashioned teenage tomfoolery of destroying <laughs> mailboxes. Uh, from automobiles, which uh, I think has a long history in the uh, teen pantheon. <laughs> yes, and there's a great scene a little bit later after this where a guy stops him with a gun and is like, you wrecked my mailbox. <laughs> <laughs> you know yes, that's yeah. a federal offense. <laughs> yes, again, uh, a very Texas setting here. A lot of people pull out guns to solve their problems. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. For, so for, good for, 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 for a generally lighthearted teen movie. Here, there's a lot of guns being pointed at teenagers. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> Wild West. That's what it was. Yes. Um, so, 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 back to the car and the seniors and the mailboxes. So they're all trashing these mailboxes here, and then someone points out there's a bowling ball in the car. Mm-hmm. And uh, the the seniors all start kind of chanting for Mitch to throw the you know throw the bowling ball out of the car, yeah. uh, which you know is a somewhat vague direction. <laughs> and uh, Mitch is new to this group of a uh, group of guys. He doesn't exactly know what their norms and boundaries are. He's never smoked pot before. He's right. cl- never drove around and smashed mailboxes before. Mm-hmm. You know, but he he kind of asks a couple times, "Are you sure? Should I do this? Should I do it?" And finally, he throws the bowling ball out the car uh, directly into the 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 rear window of a parked car. Mm-hmm. And there's this great moment because the entire car just kind of goes silent, and like you know, a couple of the guys kind of get bug eyed, like, "Whoa, hold on, mm-hmm. that's not what we meant, or that's not not what we were expecting." Mm-hmm. You know, uh, kind of, uh, kind of in the, kind of in the, I guess the, in, in, in the hierarchy of teenage shenanigans here, like, oh, like smashing mailboxes and knocking over garbage cans. That's fine. But you don't mess with another person's car. Like that's, a, that's another level. Yeah. Woo. Yeah. It so was the, rough. The, 
yeah, there's that whole moment. The whole car is suddenly like, whoa, hold on here. Are we okay with this? Mm -hmm. And th th there's that little pause. And, you know, it's, it's kind of a critical moment there because the group, that group, you know, they have their norms. And this mm -hmm. is outside their norm. And how are they going to respond to that? Are they going to uh, reprimand uh, Mitch for pushing things beyond their their boundaries? And, you know, one of the teens is just like, ah, F it. And they mm -hmm. all start laughing. So they've all kind of agreed, okay, that was okay, actually. Yeah. So yeah. If, if in that moment, the group norms have shifted, right? The group has now become a little more extreme in mm -hmm. the types of shenanigans they consider acceptable on this day here. So the group has become more polarized. Yeah. And the interesting thing I saw in reference to this, as I saw you put your note down and I was I was uh, putting together a talk on my expertise, which is cognitive biases. And I was I had watched the movie again while I was doing this talk and it was kind of it just kind of coalesced. And you put this point down and I just saw that so there's a new paper that came out that is uh, that attempted and is attempting to simplify the complex web of cognitive biases like there's this codex out there that has all like 100 almost 200 uh, biases that have been labeled in the literature and they're like let's make this a little bit more simplified and they came up with six core fundamental biased beliefs and i think the one that fits here is the ones that the authors identified as quote my group members are good and and this plays into a ton of other biases that have been named in in the literature like stereotypes and things like that in group bias all, all sorts of things but i think it fits here with this group polarization example because mitch at the very end, as you say, there there was this moment where they were like, uh, what do we do about that? And because they're driving away and they're high and they're drunk mm -hmm. and that was a gnarly thing to do that they were like, he's one of us now. And what he did was good. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and and I thought that fit really well with uh, that particular scene. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, the the the. the, the the fascinating kind of underlying psychology here is you know, everyone, you know, in this group is also concerned about, you know, am I fitting in? Am I cool? And, you know, to, uh, to be the one who kind of says, well, hold on here. Uh, that's out of bounds here. You know, uh, we've gone too far. That's not cool, man. You, you can't be the buzzkill, you know? Yeah. So, you know, th th there is this this inherent pressure to, you know, if anything, take things further. Like, don't be the one who calls things back. Be the one who pushes things forward. So I want to take that idea that you just laid out and th this idea of self-presentation and save that for the next segment. So, listener, stay tuned. We're going to talk more Days and Confused with Dr. Chris Miller after this break. Hey friends, Astrid here. You may know me from such films as Crazy Rich Asians, White Oleander, or How to Train Your Dragon. Wait, what, what was that? I wasn't in those. I wasn't in those. Okay, that wasn't me. Ooh, okay, well. Astrid here. You may know me as the other half of your favorite podcast host, Dr. Alex Swan, and I'm here to shout out listeners like you. Thanks for supporting the pod. Whether that's buying merch, sharing episodes on social media, or making donations, you can visit cinemasightpod.swansight.com to get your hands on previous episodes, or if you're like me, just another hoodie because we live in the Midwest. We appreciate you. Now, back to the show. And we are back with Dr. Chris Miller talking uh, Dazed and Confused, the 1993 Richard Linklater 
film about just a bunch of high school students doing random stuff one day and one evening on the last day of school. Alice Cooper does make an appearance oh, in the song, of course. Uh, uh, you know, school's out for summer. Can't play that for you because I will get copyright flagged. But um, you know the song. So early, before the break, uh, Chris had mentioned the ways in which some of the people, in, especially in reference to the bowling ball uh, scene, which we, were, we had just finished talking about. And he brought up an interesting point about how we present ourselves to others because we are worried about others' perceptions of us as we are trying to figure out our lives as adolescents. So there's a great quote from Wooderson, Matthew McConaughey, that is pretty much emblazoned on T-shirts and every kind of merch you can get your hands on these days. Memes, all that kind of stuff of be a lot cooler if you did in reference to whether or not Mitch, the freshman, had a joint on him. And so jumping from there, Chris, what are the other characters doing for their self-presentation in this movie. I mean, self-presentation self -presentation is such a pervasive part of human life. I think we all kind of take it for granted. Okay. You know, uh, we, we often think of teenagers as being especially concerned about how other people are looking at them and judging them. And they are. I mean, the, the, that, that is a fact. But we, we're also all doing it as well. Right. You know, yeah. you know, as surely, surely as someone who has to stand up in front of a group of young people probably multiple times a week and try to come across as serious, smart, engaging and knowledgeable, you know, mm -hmm. you can be aware that you, you yourself are constantly engaging in, in some degree of self-presentation. Yeah. I don't know if I hit any of those things that you say on a daily basis. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I, aim for like one out of four or something. You know? <laughs> there we go. There we go. I, I see that. So the main character is, is pink, as we said, mm -hmm. uh, and his his thing is is he's in he can move between these different cliques. So what what are the things that he's doing uh, in this movie that change that he changes in, in his presentation when he's in different groups? Yeah, uh, Pink, Pink is very interesting because he is uh, – I mean one possibility is that he is kind of a Ferris Bueller-like character where everyone likes mm -hmm. him. He fits in all the cliques, mm -hmm. you know, or the other possibility, which I, I actually lean a little bit more towards it, that he, he's kind of in transition. Uh, okay. You know, throughout the movie, he, he he's taken out one guy who's also a football player and uh, – but also like – not as stereotypically jockey as some of the other football players we meet in this film here. So the other guy's kind of really just kind of a good time party guy. I'm trying to yeah. look up his name here because I honestly, Don. Yeah, yeah, Don. Don. Yeah, he's hanging out with Don most of the time. And he and Don will float between uh, the football players, although Don will spend more time with the football players than Pink will. And uh, Pink will spend more time uh with some of the kind of druggy rock and roll crowds there. <laughs> and, you know, and, you know, but pink is also friendly, uh, with the nerds, uh, uh, mm -hmm. uh, Tony, Mike and Cynthia, who mm -hmm. he apparently joins them for poker games sometimes. So again, he, he doesn't even have to have a feet in multiple crowds, but, uh, you know, that does present some self-presentational problems sometimes because uh, typically if you if you have these multiple audiences that they, you know that they see you as different people. Yeah. Right. The uh, the the rock and roll drug people don't care about the football team or don't care about the football season. Yeah. So, you know, uh, they don't want to see that side of him. Uh, right. The football players do, but also the football players are themselves teens. So, you know, uh, all the football players have been asked to sign this uh, pledge to not do drugs or alcohol over the summer so they can, you know, be at their at their in, in their top form for the for the next upcoming football season. Right. And most of the players are in fully intending to sign this in sincerely. Yeah. Right. You know, uh, t again, teens 
are are, are quite adept at, at what we call the kind of, kind of the uh, the two audience problem, where you know uh, I need to behave a certain way in front of teachers and parents and authority mm-hmm. figures, but also to to kind of maintain my, my reputation with my friends. I don't want to be seen as kind of you know a a do gooder or a teacher's pet or something like that. So so you know. Uh, people in the two audience problem all, often try to find ways to try try to signal, you know, a, 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 almost a secret message to the other side. You know, like maybe maybe you're like, yes, mom, but you're kind of rolling your, rolling your eyes to your friend or <laughs> making some, you know, hand gestures or something to say, I, I don't yeah. really believe this stuff here. So, right. you know, most of the football players have no intention of following this pledge, but, you know, right. OK, fine, whatever. I'll sign this thing. But Pink is this one who apparently – wants to make a stand out of this like i'm not gonna play you can't control my life this way mm-hmm. and you know if there's any major conflict of the movie i guess we're supposed to believe uh pink's uh decision to either sign the pledge or stand up for his beliefs is supposed to be that decision yeah uh you know, again certainly uh Rewatching this as a full-blooded adult now, I don't find that uh, stand as meaningful. And I do appreciate yeah. in the movie that m- many of his friends are just telling him, like, why are you like this? Like, you know, <laughs> it's not a big deal. Just go ahead and sign it. Or in another, I, I, th- I believe his girlfriend's like, I can't believe you're asking, you're acting so oppressed. Like, you know, you're, you know, you're on the football team. You, uh, you're basically a king of the school. He is kind of the popular. He he is definitely the popular one, as you said, like a Ferris Bueller type, sort mm-hmm. of larger than larger than life kind of guy. And and I and I think that I mean his characterization and Jeremy London plays this pretty well as someone who is essentially nonplussed about a lot of things. Mm-hmm. Um, but I while I believe the I agree with you that the conflict itself in signing or not to sign mm-hmm. is a rather flimsy uh, thread throughout the movie. I do appreciate the character s- standing by his principles that he doesn't mm-hmm. want to sign it insincerely like his teammates. Mm hmm. That he wants to, when he puts his name down, is like my word is my bond kind of kind of mentality, right? Where he says to himself that I'm going to be the kind of person that I want to be to everybody, regardless of who they are. And he sums that up pretty nicely, telling off the coach at the end of the movie, like, I'm not going to sign your crappy, your crappy thing. And he knows and it is it's great too because he knows he has some leverage in being principled because he's the star quarterback. Right, right. He certainly has that option. But mm-hmm. yeah, uh, throughout the movie, kind of back to the self-presentation, he, he's kind of frequently, you know, saying, I'm not gonna do this, and kind of almost flamboyantly throwing away the pledge and then in, in front in, in, in front of others. And yeah. again, that final scene with a coach, he throws it literally right in his coach's face in front of his kind of rocker sonar friends here. So kind of in a way, almost kind of declaring his allegiance that yeah. I'm not I'm not going to bow down to the man. And we have to I think we have to, as the viewer, either recognize that that's not going to end well for him and he's not going to play football or. I think more importantly uh, and more appropriately, the coach acquiesces because mm-hmm. yeah. the coach wants to win. Yeah. And, and if, you know, and if he loses his quarterback, well, that's not going to get him the wins he wants. Right. Right. You know, uh, a starting quarterback going into your uh, senior into your in, into his senior year. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's the guy the hopes and dreams of the uh, football team is really resting upon. Even though I'm not sure that they picked an actor who could uh, be believable as a star Texas high school quarterback. The, 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 there's that great little scene early in the movie when an old man kind of grabs him by the arm and says, is that arm ready to, th- ready to throw for 2,000 yards this season? And I'm like, <laughs> it's clearly not. That guy's clearly a skinny little rocker dude. 
Right. I I cannot believe him as a football player. But that's sorry, just a little side commentary. I, yeah, no, I I mean I agree. Like they it, they could have Richard Linklater could have asked Jeremy London to bulk up just a smidge. Just a smidge. Yeah, now yeah. granted, it's probably like May some end of May, early June. And mm-hmm. so he's he's sloughed off all of the weight and bulk that he put on for the football season because mm-hmm. spring is off season. You kind of right. do whatever you like. Maybe he'd bulk up some more for <laughs> uh, a, you know, an August start. But, you know, yeah. you're right. He could have at least looked <laughs> the part. But yeah, the, the, uh, the coaches were very concerned that, you know, the. Kids are going to get into dr- drinking and drugs over this summer. They're going to hang out around the pool and, you know, uh, get out of shape. So, you know, m- m- perhaps that process has, has already begun for Pink since he is clearly questioning if, uh, if, 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 if continuing to play football is kind of worth the bother for him. Yeah. And I, and, and just to wrap up that point a little bit, I think that. By the end, as he tosses the uh, the pledge back into his coach's face, as you said, he he declares his allegiance to the type of person that he wants to be. And it's it's interesting because we don't actually end the movie with them. We end the movie with Mitch. Mm hmm. Um, so I think it's quite interesting. And you're kind of left to think about, you know, what's next for what's next for Pink? Is, yeah. is he yeah. going to say, all right, I'm done with football. I'll, I'll, you know, be friends with these people, but I'm not going to be on the same team with them because, you know, I don't I don't want to play football anymore. Mm-hmm. That's not who I who I am anymore. Right. As 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 teenagers right, right. are developing their self concepts and uh, who they want to be mm-hmm. uh, in the ne- in their next life. Yeah. But of course, you know, uh, there are like brief scenes of him. Uh, talking to the football players because the, these are guys he's played football with for years. You know, mm-hmm. these are guys he perhaps grew up playing football with here. Right. So, you know, in, in some ways, it, 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 it would actually be a pretty painful break to really, you know, quit the team senior year. Again, they, 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 they tell him directly, no one does that. No one quits senior year. You know, it's kind of social suicide. But I think even, I mean, with with Slater, being his his good druggy buddy friend is just like, you know, everything's green on this side of the grass, buddy. <laughs> Everything is green. <laughs> Absolutely. So, I mean, there's there's a pull from both sides and and you, you can't really tell. And so a lot of people are talking at Pink as mm-hmm. opposed to Pink explaining himself a little bit more fluently. And I think that's I think that represents uh, a at least my high school experience where a lot of people were just talking at me and I wasn't really explaining my wants and my desires to other people because that may have been social suicide. So I, I, and, and as very much a similar, and this is probably personality based, but very similar situation to uh, me pre tenure and mm-hmm. me now post tenure, like I'm I feel like I'm especially with my colleagues, just two different individuals because I didn't didn't want to say anything mm-hmm. that would ruin my chances for tenure. And now I'm just like, well, I've got tenure. Which is, <laughs> right. Right. You know, uh, I, I've always said uh, when or if I get tenure, uh, I'm, I'm going to start start uh, start uh, dressing in steampunk. <laughs> it's just, full, it's just f- fully commit to it. it's like okay h- here's the real me it, it was it was I, I held it back for a while but now i'm gonna wear trench coats and monocles and the whole whole thing you're gonna have a uh an umbrella that has a sword inside of it oh yeah oh it'll be amazing what air raid freshman oh come on darla leave no her. tony tony this is between me and her and she better be on the ground in, in five seconds Wait, she doesn't have to air raid because she's with me, okay? <laughs> air raid or it's your ass. Don't do it, Sabrina. Oh, that's it. Miss Hot Stuff. I'm going to make the next year of your life a living hell. 
<laughs> Lick me, all of you. <laughs> Good for you. So speaking of conflict, <laughs> let's uh, round out this episode here talking about two, uh, one of them, an amazing uh, set of circumstances, and then one not so much conflict because it it it, it doesn't seem earned to me. So I want to mm-hmm. talk about the Darla and Sabrina conflict. Doesn't mm-hmm. it, it feels tacked on, feels like one of the things that, Link later could have cut from the final edit, but you know mm-hmm. it's fine. So, you were you had mentioned earlier, Chris, that uh, uh, women and girls tend to have more relational aggression toward each other, and so the conflict between these two individuals uh, goes. Uh, how does that go in the movie? So, I mean, first of all, you you almost had to add, had, had kind of add the add the caveat, kind of as you said, it didn't really feel earned. Really, most of the female characters were kind of underdeveloped in this movie. Yeah, you know, Sabrina was kind of our female point of view freshman character for the hazing, but she was also usually a silent observer. Yeah, you know, she didn't often even say that much. You know, we just kind of saw her going through things. Mm-hmm. You know, but uh, yeah, at the very end, suddenly Darla, kind of the 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 meanest of the mean girls, uh, mm-hmm. played by the amazing Parker Posey. I, I right. love Parker Posey. You know, Darla sees Sabrina uh, talking with an older boy that is uh, Tony. Tony, yeah, yeah, who uh, who she, she had met during the hazing there, so she was kind of led over to Tony to humiliate herself in front of him Mm -hmm. uh, during the hazing. And uh, uh, Tony, of course, being the kind of nerd social psychologist who's not really into that, doesn't really engage with it. So he just kind of like, oh, hi, nice to meet you and stuff. And uh, they later meet again at the party and they they start talking. And we don't see those conversations because, again, we don't get to hear from the female characters very much in this movie. But, you Mm -hmm. know... Uh, Darla kind of stumbles across them and she's like, oh, you're a freshman and just tries to basically tries to resume the hazing you right. know, of ordering her to air raid, which is like, kind of the, like, you know, it's kind of a kind of the stop, drop and cover of the old uh, uh, Cold War era there, the, yeah. the, the the training school there. Oh, there's a nuclear bomb going off. Just uh, drop and cover, you know. Right. So uh, Darla orders you know sabrina to kind of throw herself to the ground in front of her just because she asked and uh you know tony tries to interrupt and i was like no 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 you have no say here this is between me and her yeah and uh sabrina ultimately uh chooses not to follow her directions here and darling quite explicitly threatens her oh your next year is going to be hell yeah you know, because again, you know, she she had been invited to partake in this little ritual, which she, again, again, on the girl side, there not all the girls got to do this here. So, right, uh, you know, her her standing up for herself there could have consequences, as you said. Parker Posey is amazing, and she does a great job of being antagonistic. But it feels like it it was just a way to end Sabrina's story. Hmm. Because we're not gonna follow that character again. Like we're 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 not gonna we're not gonna see her again. And so it just feels like it was tacked on. But it does have a great little it's it's a great little vignette. I would say like if you wanted to show relational aggression without mm-hmm. any context, any necessary context for any backstory at all, and you just wanted to show a clip, I think this is a great clip. Mm-hmm. Um, in, in in amongst various other examples, but this is a great clip because you don't have to know what an air raid like do an air raid because mm-hmm. regardless of what that is, you don't have any have any context for that. You could also think it's sex. Um, but the fact that Sabrina says no, and then Darla goes, "All right, well, you're gonna you're gonna have a really crappy year next year, and mm-hmm. I'm gonna see to it. No, th- no other kind of uh a uh." uh threatening physical aggression Mm -hmm. is she's essentially saying it as she's walking away right you know so there's so there's 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 space between it but a really good example of what relational aggression looks like amongst high school students and uh sabrina's best hope is is probably that at that point darla seemed pretty drunk so yeah hopefully she won't even remember this minor run-in with a 
minor freshman and uh, doesn't doesn't take that up. Who? Me? I was the <laughs> one that you said to do air raid and I said no? No, 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 no. I, I, I think you had come across another person, Darla. I yeah. totally would have done air raid for you right quick. <laughs> I think you may have been drunk that evening. I mm -hmm. think so. But really, the best conflict is the amazing Adam Goldberg mm -hmm. uh, as Mike getting into the most random altercation with this character, Clint, mm -hmm. at this party in the woods. Uh, where the Darla and Sabrina uh, uh, co uh, conflict happens as well. And so explain to the listeners what happens with this conflict, Chris. He's, he's been around. He's been in the background doing typical guy stuff, car talking, <laughs> car racing, you know, uh, perhaps almost uh, representing a clique that we, that, we ha that, that, that we didn't see much of, of car guys. Which, okay, uh, yeah, car guys, cer yeah. Certainly, certainly might be a thing. But yeah, you know, uh, Clint is at the party. He's hanging out with a couple of his friends. Uh, they are smoking some reefer, as one mm -hmm. does. Uh, Tony, Mike, and Cynthia arrive at this party, and mm -hmm. they are not regular party goers. You know, right. they again being again on, on the nerdier side. This is not normally their thing here, but they're like, "Oh, come on! Yeah. It's last day of school. We're gonna go out there and and do this here." So they're arriving at the party, and they're walking by uh, Clint and his friends smoking a joint. Man, someone's smoking some weed, bro. <laughs> hey, man. Hey, slow down. Yeah, what? what's up? Hey, how's it going? What'd you just say? When? Just now, man, when you walked past. What'd you say? Uh, about what? You said someone's token some reefer. No, I may have said something about smelling some pot. No, it's just an observation. <laughs> oh, an observation, huh? Well, who the hell are you, man? Isaac f***ing Newton? You can see in that moment that, you know, uh, Clint and his friends, they notice that. Mm -hmm. they, they hear him say that, and all of Clint's friends look at Clint. Mm -hmm. And to me, you know, the, the, they're doing a great job of kind of capturing here that M Mike doesn't realize it yet. He's He's about to realize it, but... Mike doesn't realize it yet, but he he's just com just uh, committed uh, a minimum of faux pas, or even worse, he is issued a challenge, right? Uh, he's kind of challenged uh, Clint's status here because talking right. about someone else in certain contexts certainly can be seen as a challenge, right? Right. So uh, particularly in in uh, what we call cultures of honor. So, right. you know, of which Texas absolutely qualifies as a culture of honor. It's some of those more traditional, you know, stand up for your name, you know, uh, 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 stand up for your people beliefs here. Uh, uh, often observed it in, in places that have a history of kind of more wild, wild west attitudes and uh, law enforcement. So, yeah, uh, by talking about Clint – you know, that way he's kind of issued a challenge mm -hmm. and Clint is not going to let this nerd come strolling by making comments about him in front of his friends. Right. That was mm -hmm. a challenge, even though uh, Mike certainly didn't mean it that way. Right. right? So, Clint kind of, uh, so, yeah, so Clint kind of immediately, you know, goes over and kind of confronts Mike. And Mike clearly at first has no idea what he's done or, or, or if he does, thinks it's no big deal until Clint very quickly, very, very quickly escalates and tries to provoke a physical fight with him. Right. Takes off and, his jacket or whatever. And yeah, yeah. Uh, 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 peels off his shirt. Yeah. You know, charges right at him is, 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 yep. is, is about to get into it. But it, but it, but it's broken up by Pink and, and, and I believe uh, Pink and Wooderson kind of jump in and mm -hmm. break things up. And Mike kind of quickly retreats. Again, you know, he's he's not that type of guy. He doesn't want any part of that. And, you know, he, he's kind of happy to just get out of there, you know, to, to kind of be rescued by a couple other people, including Pink, who he knows. And, and I think that this is classic, somebody in their element and somebody not in their element. And I think the, 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 the rest of the conflict 
gets sort of larger than life, I think. Yeah, yeah. No, so what I find really fascinating is is is, is what they do with that initial conflict, you know, because – you know, in that moment, Clint felt challenged. So Clint, uh, you know, felt the need to put on, uh, in 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 self presentational terms, what we call a performance. Mm-hmm. Like uh, this low status nerd has kind of challenged me socially, and you know, acts like he can go around talking about me in front yeah. of other people. Yeah. So uh, Clint stages a performance. He kind of you know physically dominates him, makes him look weak. And Mike retreats. And mm. as far as Clint is concerned, that's over. Okay. You know, I mean, you know, the, that guy stepped out of line. I put him back in his place. And Clint is happy to resume his evening of smoking pot, drinking, and uh, eventually hitting on women. Essentially, very ape like, right? Absolutely. Uh, absolutely. If- when you see challenges to, to, to the troop hierarchy and like chimps and bonobos. They'll, yeah. It'll usually just be a display mm-hmm. of the bigger, stronger one, and then any challengers will will retreat. And so it's very ape like of them. Yeah, absolutely. You know, there 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 is, there is a dominant male monkey mfer is how right. uh, Mike Mike later described him. So you know, Mike later came to, came to realize that the came to realize the social dynamics of what happened there very, very accurately. I think, uh, I think as, as you said, social psychologist, I had, I had written down anthropologists. I think, I think uh, Mike and Tony are, Mm -hmm. are, uh, are in, in movie guides here. Absolutely. But, you know, at at this point, like Mike, he continues to kind of fixate on this moment there. He's, you know, again, you know, after a provocation happens, you know, we engage in cognitive processes, you know, so we can all kind of figure out ways to calm ourselves down and rationalize and kind of like, well, okay, you know, that wasn't great, but it's over. Let's just move on, you know, or you can kind of fixate on it and ruminate and say, well, wait a minute, that jerk, he just embarrassed me. And, you know, all these things happen. And, you know, they actually show in the movie, you know, like Mike says some of this, you know, uh, with his friends who his his friends have also kind of forgotten and moved on or having yeah. a good time. And Mike yeah. is still thinking about it. Uh Mike wanders off. He, like, he's 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 shown just he's shown just kind of stalking through the woods by himself, drinking, you know, thinking about this here and thinking about how. And he finally comes back and he has this rant about I, I'm I'm not going to let this be another moment where I'm you know just a little ineffectual, nothing here. You know, he he, he wants to stage his own performance. He wants to change his narrative. Like, I, I don't want to be seen as this weak right. nerd who gets pushed around that way. And he, of course, comes up comes up with his master plan of okay, I'm gonna go to that guy and I'm gonna punch him. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm just gonna swing at him because you know, big public place, a lot of people around. Fights get broken up pretty quickly, so I, I, if I can throw a punch or two, then play defense, and you know, I'll come out looking pretty good on this whole thing. That was his plan, <laughs> <laughs> and he gets that punch in, and they they uh, it's they a go great at it punch. For a while. I mean, he he yeah. knocks him flat. It's a great punch, and then sometimes that's all you need, right? Yeah, I would say, but yeah, but Clint got right back up and right. picked up where where he left off, and uh, demonstrates it first of all that Mike, our, our social psychologist, had misread the situation. People are not that quick to break up fights. Uh, in this sort of uncontrolled and uncontrolled social setting yeah and his performance really goes quite disastrous here because he ends up really further embarrassing himself Mm -hmm. by getting beaten badly and you know sobbing honestly after it happens although again there's a great scene later on in the car just kind of uh, gauging his wounds in the mirror, trying to trying to change the narrative. Like, well, you know, in a hundred years, people just say, you know, there was a duel, there was a fight, there was a brawl. <laughs> you know, the winners and losers don't matter anymore. So again, right. trying to, 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 try, to trying to fashion a new narrative out of it. So again, he it seems like he's of uh, on his path to recovery, but. Yeah, he's he sort of says uh, to to the audience that. While history is written by the victors, when the victors are kind of dumb, 
the losers can jump in there with a slight change. <laughs> so I think I, I think again we close the door, and and we kind of don't hear from either Mike or Tony again. Uh, even e- the Darla and Sabrina scene is after this, mm-hmm. uh, but it's not really a Tony uh, bit there. So this is sort of our last time with the anthropologist, social psychologist of the movie. <laughs> And mm-hmm. I, I like the little I like the little the little insert there that, you know, while the brutes get the victory and they, they get to write the story, <laughs> sometimes mm-hmm. the uh, sometimes the promoters, sometimes the uh, the smart, the smart ones get in there with their own little bits. Mm-hmm. A very, very science forward. I love it. Yeah. You know, so I mean, uh, the court there is, of course, the, there there's the there is the event but it's also the spin. So maybe maybe Mike's uh, future career is, uh, you know, a spin doctor, uh, you know, public relations spin doctor yeah. or something yeah. there. Just a marketing uh, pub, uh, PR guru. <laughs> All right. Well, that is going to do it for this episode. I want to thank Dr. Chris Miller for joining me to discuss dazed and confused i think we were all dazed and a little confused so before we say goodbye chris uh is there anything that you'd like to plug uh what uh what people can learn more about you and your work i'm on twitter of course at uh psych is nonlinear. okay if you want to follow along to my random daily observations of the uh news and probably far too much politics for any healthy person to consume. <laughs> uh, but also, you know, feel free to uh, check out my LinkedIn because I'm on the market and for, I'm, I'm really looking to uh, to to uh, find my own second act here outside mm-hmm. of academia here. So if something in today's conversation has spurred you to think, I want to I want to work with that guy. <laughs> By all means, uh, uh, reach out to me here. I'm uh, curious to uh, to see uh, maybe Texas high school football coach or yeah as long as you know they sign a pledge that they won't do any drugs yeah <laughs> you know or maybe i'll get a job working for the city you know put some money in my pocket <laughs> right <laughs> oh as long as you don't end up as the blind clerk who sells beer <laughs> to a 14 year old kid mm-hmm. i think you're good good deal good deal Well, that is wonderful, and please do hit them up. I will link those in the show notes just in case you want to do a little clicky click. Thanks again, Chris, for joining me. Thank you so much much for having me. I I had a a lot of fun. And that's going to do it for this episode. Until the next one, thanks for listening.